Earlier this month, House Democrats passed H.R. 1, a sweeping piece of legislation aimed at getting money out of politics, increasing transparency, and expanding voting rights. But the day this bill cleared the House, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell vowed that he wouldn't bring it to a vote. Here is what Senator McConnell had to say when asked about that. Yeah. Obviously, um, you're opposed to H.R. 1. You're also opposed to the Green New Deal. Why is the Green New Deal getting a vote in the Senate when H.R. 1 is not? Uh, because I get to decide what we vote on. Well, <laughs> you mess the man with has a Mitch, point. You get the answer. <laughs> Rock the Vote, a nonprofit dedicated to building the political power of young people, is urging a Senate vote on H.R. 1. They released a statement saying, in part, many of those in power have abandoned the notion that they work for the American people. The House took a huge step forward. The ball is now in the Senate's court. The vote will determine which senators support democracy and which do not. It is that simple. Joining us now to expand on H.R. 1's importance is Rock the Vote's president and executive director, Carolyn DeWitt. She's also a nationally recognized advocate for young people and friend of the show. Great to see you, Carolyn. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, thanks for having me here. Why is this bill to you and to your organization, more importantly, so significant? This is the most important thing facing our country right now. Um, it is at the forefront of basically having a, a political and governmental system that people believe in and that works determines the, the impact of all other issues. When you say this is the most important thing, you, you mean participation in the democratic process? Democracy reform. Basically, it's at all levels. So it's all, it's, it, what this bill does is it's a badly needed common sense bill that one, strengthens our ability and our, our freedom to vote. It also helps to end the dominance of big money on politics. And it also ensures that elected officials are actually representing the public interest and not special interests. Can you, so just with some specifics, how, how sure. does it, how does it expand? How does it, how does it accomplish? Yeah, what you're laying out are the goals of the bill. How is it accomplishing these things? Yeah, so strengthening it? our freedom to vote. Um, it encourages states and really has states um, adopt automatic voter registration, same day registration, online voter registration, which Rock the Vote has worked on since 1999, actually. Um, it also requires states to have early voting and make sure that those hours allow for working Americans to actually be able to vote early. Um, in terms of ending, helping to end the dominance of big money on politics, it tightens, it really shines a light first on uh, those behind the scenes dark money. Um, it tightens restrictions on super PACs, and then it also limits how much foreign actors can really influence, um, as well as it gives uh, the agencies that actually monitor campaign finance and um, ethics the ability to actually impact it and hold people accountable. The, the, the Democrats have been speaking pretty openly now, including candidates for the presidency, about lowering the voting age to 16 nationally for federal yeah. elections. Does your organization have a stance on that, and what do you think of that? We do, yeah. Uh, so voting at 16, I mean, this is not part of, part of HR 1 right now, but it was brought up in, in the discussions, um, is, a, is, a, is something that we do support. I mean, at 16, individuals are already work, part of the workforce, um, so they are contributing through taxes, and they're not getting a say in where those taxes go. Um, it also, we've seen in, in different localities that there's been a big push to have 16-year-olds vote in local elections. Um, and what that also helps us do is actually get civics education back into schools, um, because we've, we've gotten very far away from that as well. What are the good faith arguments, in your view, made against HR1? Uh, there aren't any, quite frankly. <laughs> because one of the things that we, we had a, a politician, I don't remember his name, unfortunately, sorry, forgive me, but he, he basically argued because of the public finance of elections piece here that voters in his state may be subsidizing candidates elsewhere that they don't even support. I think another potential good faith argument could be made that this is really undermining the principles of federalism. You're forcing states to hold their elections in a certain way and handle early voting in a certain way. Um, what do you make of those critiques? So I would say the, the issue about federalism, right, is we have been without the real protections of the Voting Rights Act, uh, which was passed in 1965. And the decision from Shelby versus County in 2013 has really gutted that legislation. And what Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court said in that decision is, we're throwing it back on Congress to actually fix this. And so HR1 is a fix to to restore and expand the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which actually helps to prevent states from discri discriminatory laws. So part of HR1 is a constitutional amendment to and Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that the left really dislikes for a whole bunch of reasons. 
the government held in Citizens United that they can ban books within a time frame before the election. So essentially, you can't write an anti-Hillary Clinton book 90 days ahead of a federal election. Does your organization support banning books before elections? I don't think that's where the legislation, like I think we're pulling at very specific pieces of the, legi the legislation. What Citizens United really did is brought big money into politics so that we're not having everyday individuals actually have an impact on, on um, they don't have the same power that someone with a lot of money that corporations have in our pol in our political system right now. And so we've lost sight of the fact that we are a democracy that is supposed to be by the people, of the people, and for the people. And right now, we're arguably getting into a space where we're not really a democracy and where we're actually letting very few people decide where our country and goes. What do you think of the concerns that making donor lists for super PACs public will just lead to harassment of individuals. I mean, we see now targeted campaigns against people of all kinds in the media, private citizens who are supporting different political activities. Uh, shouldn't people have a right to be able to donate in peace and privacy without having their names splashed all over the place so they can be boycott, uh, boycotted, so they can be attacked for their views? There is, you know, a freedom, there's freedom of speech, yes, but that does not mean that you, that is freedom from consequences of your speech, and I think that's what we've actually lost a lot of. And so, yes, you can support who you want to, and you can support whatever issues you want to, but that needs to be public information, because the public and the American people actually need to know who's influencing the politics. Donald Trump very sort of memorably, in a way, ran on the problem with big money. I mean, it was funny because he said, look, I understand how the system works because I engaged in it. I bought these people off, so I know exactly how this works. I think I've always thought that that was an undersold part of his appeal, that he was this rich guy and so he couldn't be bought off. I mean, that ended up not being true at all, but that's neither here nor there. I thought maybe in my most optimistic dreams that there might be a confluence between Trump and the Republicans and Democrats on this issue of money in politics because the American people are genuinely disgusted with the system that we have. Has that borne out at all? And are there any Republicans who have expressed support for H.R. 1 or any ideas that are contained therein? Yeah, I mean, this had bipartisan support in the House. And one of the critiques is McConnell is not bringing it to the Senate floor because he's afraid it will actually pass. And his not bringing it to the floor is really reflective of, of what we're talking about here. We know that support for Democratic reforms is overwhelmingly, there is overwhelmingly public support for it. And so right now, you have McConnell who won't bring it to the Senate floor. He is choosing special interests in his own, building his own golden parachute instead of actually paying attention is to there, the Is there wants. any other way to get it to the floor? Any like, you know, legally blonde type discharge <laughs> petition <laughs> method of getting this to the floor without McConnell's There consent. are probably more creative people okay. and legal people to answer that question, but what we really need to do is put pressure so organizations, other senators, and American voters should be should be calling their senators and calling Mitch McConnell's office to require this to be brought to the floor. Some of the Democratic candidates for president have also expressed a desire to get rid of the Electoral College, or at least an open-mindedness about a discussion of getting rid of the Electoral College and having a more... That is open to a conversation on... I mean, he's open to a conversation on anything, Crystal, apparently, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hacking in the 90s. Um, but but it, you know, looking at the Electoral College, do you or your organization have a position on whether we should have just a direct democracy and eliminate eliminate the federalist system that we've had for a couple hundred years. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So actually, uh, we are very much about dismantling the Electoral College. It is something that the American public wants, and it is very much we need to get back to one vote, one person. Um, and so there is actually a way to do this that is not impossible, um, which is the National Popular Vote State Compact. Um, and so I think we just had another state join it. Uh, Colorado. Recent, yeah, recently. And so we're actually not that far. We just need a few more states to actually sign on to it, and then we'll, we'll effectively um, not have the Electoral College anymore. If it passes. Yes. If, if it passes in the enough states and the courts say that it's okay. She's just kicking at the load-bearing wall set up by the Founding Fathers, Crystal. We'll think, see how uh, this goes. I think Trump has taken a sledgehammer. <laughs> <on this, so. laughs> he is a builder. <laughs> Carolyn, Thanks so thank much you. for coming in. Thanks for having me. Next on Rising, the Iron Stash is back. Am I allowed to call him that? Absolutely, uh, yeah. But this insane. time with a new group making sure <laughs> working class voices are heard in the 2020 election. Former Wisconsin House candidate Randy Bryce tells us all about the Iron Pack and how they have already achieved their first victory in 2019. That one Rising continues.